Great. Thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. I want to thank the organizers for putting together this really nice workshop. It's so nice to actually interact with people in person. Um, yeah, so um, today um, I'm going to be talking about some work that uh, I, I did with uh, um, Sri Ram Ganeshan. It's uh, posted mostly on this paper that we posted uh, last month. Um, and basically it's about um, the question of constructing lattice edge theories for topological phases of matter. So um, I need to first sort of set some terminology and tell you what I mean by topological phases of matter and what I mean by lattice edge theories. Um, yeah, I guess I can use this. So in this talk, what I mean by a topological phase of matter, I'm always going to be thinking about two-dimensional systems. So I'm thinking about some two-dimensional quantum anybody system with a, a, some kind of a bulk energy gap and with anion excitations. Okay, so uh, it's just a, what you might call a intrinsically topologically ordered state. Uh, it has anions. And here, these two dots are supposed to be two anions, you know, A and B. If I braid one around the other, maybe I get some phase or something like that. And um, in, in this talk, I'm not going to be worried about symmetries. So uh, I just want to emphasize this here. I'm really going to be thinking about just topological phases of matter. And global symmetries will not really play any role in this talk at all. So I'm not really thinking about symmetry in rich phases. I'm just thinking about the physics of anions and, and, uh, and, and the topological phases that um, describe them. OK, so. Um, you know, one of the most important aspects of topological phase of matter is that often if you take a topological phase in a geometry with a boundary, you find that although the system is, of course, gapped in the bulk, basically by definition, if you define it in geometry of the boundary, you find some kind of gapless modes that propagate along the boundary. These are gapless edge excitations. So this is often the case, not always, but often the case. And when you have these uh, low energy degrees of freedom uh, around the boundary, you, it's uh, very useful to, to try to describe them by some kind of effective theory. And that's what we call basically an edge theory. So what is an edge theory? So for the, at its core, um, and certainly for the purposes of this talk, an edge theory is just um, consists of basically two pieces of data. It's a, it's a Hilbert space, H, and it's a set of local operators, O, that act on this Hilbert space. And yes? Yeah, one question about your first transparency. I, I thought that these systems that have onions have some kind of symmetry, like one form symmetry or things like that. Okay, yeah. So I'm, when I say global symmetry, I mean zero form symmetry. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, an edge theory consists of two pieces of data at its core. It's a Hilbert space and a set of local operators acting on that Hilbert space. Uh, and these two pieces of data have a simple physical interpretation. The Hilbert space is basically this describes the set of low energy edge excitations. And this set of local operators, this basically you can think of as describing the local operators in the original 2D system projected onto the uh, this uh, subspace of low energy edge excitations. So these two pieces of data are supposed to describe that low energy subspace of edge excitations. And, um, and, and any dynamics you want to describe within that subspace, you can describe by some Hamiltonian, which would be written as a sum of these, these operators. Uh, OK, so um, let me give you an example. What's the sort of uh, maybe most famous example of an edge theory of a topological phase is the, uh, is the, uh, the edge of the, the edge theory for the Laughlin state. So that we have here, I've drawn the uh, particular Laughlin state, let's say filling fraction one over K, where K is an odd integer. And um, uh, as, as you know, uh, when you take the Laughlin state in geometry with the boundary, what you find is that they're gapless modes at the boundary, and they're actually in the simplest form, they're chiral modes that propagate in just one direction. So you have these chiral gapless modes, and you may ask, what's the edge theory that describes the physics of these low energy ex edge excitations? Um, and so let me just remind you how that, what that edge theory looks like. So uh, this edge theory is often called the chiral boson edge theory because of the, the theory I'm gonna write down is sort of in terms of something like chiral boson field theory. And as I told you, an edge theory really, I, I, to, to define an edge theory, I have to tell you two things, the set of local operators and the Hilbert space. So what are those two things? So let me start with the local operators. So the local operators are, take this form, at least in the normalization conventions that I'm gonna use, the local operators are the form e to the i k phi of x, where phi is a field, 
uh, depends, X here is a one-dimensional coordinate along the edge. Um, and so the local operators of this form, and um, I should say that these local operators have a simple physical interpretation. These are the electron operators, electron creation or annihilation operator, depending on your convention. And all other local operators can, of course, be built out of the electron operators. So in particular, they can be built out of these by taking products of these operators or taking derivatives, uh, et cetera. So these are kind of the basic local operators. I, I don't, I'm not writing the whole list, just the basic ones from which all other local operators can be constructed. So these are local operators, and then this field phi satisfies two kind of algebraic properties. So it obeys this commutation algebra, uh, the commutator between phi of x and the derivative of phi at some point y is proportional to this delta function, the factor of one over k. And there's kind of a global, you can think of this as a global boundary condition. L here is uh, supposed to be, say, the circumference of your disk. And it roughly states the fact that the total um, amount of charge on the boundary of your disk has to be um, uh, an integer, um, assuming that I'm describing the edge of a, of a, of a quantum Hall state, which with no anions in the bulk. So the total charge on the edge has to be an integer. That's basically this condition. And, and these two conditions um, basically tell you everything about your edge theory. They're kind of an algebraic description of your edge theory. And so in particular, the Hilbert space, one way to define the Hilbert space is to just say it's, it's some representation. It's the, there's basically a uh, map maybe this uh, unique irreducible representation of this algebra, it's infinite dimensional, that's the Hilbert space. So the edge theory is completely described by this set of local operators and this algebra and the Hilbert space is the representation of this, this algebra. Okay, so this is a, a very useful uh, edge theory and a very famous one. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, maybe it should be obvious here is that it's, inter it's a continuum, it's a description involving a continuum field and it has infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so the kind of question that in this talk is to whether we can find edge theories that are not like this, that are not described by continuum fields, that are not, do not have infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So the basic question is, do there exist lattice edge theories? Uh, a lattice edge theories. Now, what do I mean by a lattice edge theory? Um, so um, the precise definition that I'll use in this talk is a lattice edge theory is something which has basically a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Or more precisely, it has a finite dimensional Hilbert space for a finite size system. Of course, as we make our edge longer and longer, the Hilbert space dimension should scale exponentially uh, with the length of the circumference, but it should still be finite for a finite size system. If that's the case, I'll call it a lattice edge theory. And that should be contrasted with the previous system, the previous example where the edge theory is infinite. It's an infinite dimensional, it's infinite dimensional Hilbert space even for some finite size droplet. Okay, so that's the question um, that I want to think about. And um, first thing you might ask is why would one care? Why should we care about lattice edge theories? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, so one reason is, you know, if you have a lattice edge theory, you, you can do kind of, it provides a setting for doing a numerical analysis of your system. Maybe some kind of, any kind of non-perturbative analysis also is facilitated by having a lattice kind of finite dimensional regularization. It's also another, uh, another uh, feature is if you have, um, there's this well-known kind of thing called the coupled wire construction that allows you to take edge theories and kind of construct a model for the bulk system by putting together many wires. Each wire is kind of written in terms of the, the edge theory. So that allows you to construct bulk models from kind of edge theories. And in this case, if you have a finite dimensional edge theory, you can really construct a lattice model for the bulk, which is kind of nice. Uh, or it seems like it, at least it, it might allow you to construct a lattice model. Um, so that would be another nice reason to be interested in these. And then finally, it, maybe it'll just give us insights into the structure of the edge. In general, finding a lattice description or lattice regularization can, can give you some deep insights into the structure of anomalies and things like that. Okay, so that's why we should care. The next question is, do these edge theories exist? And they do. So let me give you the simplest example. I'll start with the simplest example. So the simplest example of the lattice edge theory is, is the edge theory of the, what's called the Tor code model. The Tor code model is an exactly solvable spin model, which I'll explain in a second, that basically describes a topological phase with the same topological order as Z2 gauge theory. It's very closely related to Z2 gauge theory. So sometimes people call it Z2 topological order. And what does the model look like? Well, we have these spins that live on the, the um, links each of these green dots spin one half degree of freedom. They live on the links of, let's say, the square lattice. Um, so it's a spin model with, made out of spin one halves that live on these links. And the Hamiltonian has two terms, 
Uh, they're both four spin interactions. There's a star term, which involves the product of four sigma x's around kind of a vertex or star. And then there's the plaquette term that involves the product of four sigma z's around a, a plaquette. And it's exactly solvable because all the terms commute and you can say everything about it. And know, we know everything about it. And in particular, if you take this system and you define it in the periodic geometry, it has a nice gap. It has some degeneracy, let's say on a torus, a fourfold degeneracy, but then it has a nice gap, okay? But if we want to construct an edge theory for this system, what we want to do is think about this model in a geometry with, uh, not in a periodic geometry, but rather in a geometry with a boundary. So for example, this is maybe the simplest boundary you could construct. You just take the torque code. Sorry, and, you know, have you considered a non-square lattice at all? Um, <laughs> the whole effect, what, what I'm saying doesn't depend on what lattice you do it on. So I'm just giving you an example of uh, how to derive this boundary by working on a, a square lattice. Okay, so like, the picture is really just for visual, not like precisely what you were doing. Well, to construct a boundary, in some sense, you only have to give one example. So to be a well-defined edge theory for some system, um, I only have to construct it for kind of one example. And I've already proven it's a physical description. So in some sense, it's enough to derive it for you on the square lattice. But, but, but independent of that, even if you worked on any other lattice, the same kind of um, this, this argument would still hold. OK, thanks. So, Okay, so I want to consider the Tor code on just like a chunk of square lattice like this. I call this region R. Um, and, and I want to consider just sort of taking the Hamiltonian and just truncating it violently. Just take all the terms that are within this region. So all the stars and all the plaquettes that, that you can draw on this sort of subgraph that I've shown here. And that's it. That's the Hamiltonian. No other terms. Okay. And if you just take this Hamiltonian and you work it out on this chunk of square lattice, you find that it again has... Um, <laughs> A gap, but now the ground state degeneracy is not some finite number. It's it's very large. It's two to the n minus one, where n is the number of spins along the boundary. The reason you get two to the n minus one is uh, these ground states are basically parameterized by the values of sigma x. You could think of them the values of sigma x on these boundary spins, and there's kind of a global constraint. The product of all those sigma x's has to be plus one. It's kind of like a Gauss law constraint. It comes from this. Uh, in, in all the, uh, from these terms in the, in the bulk. So all the states which are kind of in the ground state in the bulk, they have to obey the product of sigma x equals one. So that's why you get this, uh, you get uh, a, a two to the n minus one degenerate ground states and they're kind of parameterized by these boundary states, okay? And so you can, based on this, you can kind of quickly see what the edge theory is gonna be. Uh, and so what's the edge theory? The edge theory, Hilbert, so I have to get into the Hilbert space and the local operators. The Hilbert space is equivalent to a spin one half chain with say n spins. Those were those boundary spins. Um, but there's a global constraint. So it's a spin one half chain, but you have to look within this particular sector of this usual spin one half chain Hilbert space. It's the subspace with obeying this constraint, product of sigma x equals one. Um, and that, as I said, that was this Gauss law constraint. And then what are the local operators? Well, the local operators are all the usual local operators that are kind of, that commute with this constraint. So sigma x is a nice local operator. Another one is sigma z, sigma z. And all the local operators in our edge theory can be built out of these basic operators. Okay, so this is our lattice edge theory. In some sense, maybe the simplest one. Um, and it's, as you can see, it's nice finite dimensional. It looks a lot like a lattice model. Of course, we do have this constraint. So it's not quite like a, exactly what you're used to for a, a, a lattice model for a bulk system, but, um, but, but it's a nice, well-regulated uh, edge theory. Sorry, but this, if you perturb it, this requires a gap, right? I'm sorry? If you perturb um, it, So yeah, so, so yeah, you can now ask the question, once, see, I'm not focusing on the Hamiltonian at all. So you can then ask the question, if, uh, what if I consider some Hamiltonian, like some H, which is some, would be written out of these operators, composed out of these operators, and indeed, uh, it's for some choices of Hamiltonian, you'll get a gap phase. For generic choices, you'll get a gap phase. But you know there are other cases that are gapless, like if you're right at the phase transition between icing phase transition. Okay. Okay, but when you get a gap, then even the notion of edge theory is not well defined. So that's what that's why. Ah, uh, um, well, no, because these are all maybe what one way to think about it from this derivation is there's you could think of it one way to think about it is there's two energy scales, right? There's the bulk gap energy scale here, and then. With, and this have all these zero energy states. And now I perturb it with some, whoops. Yeah, that's right. And now I, I'm gonna add some small operators on top of that. And of course I might get, a, so I'll have two to the n minus one states. When I add that perturbation, some of those states may split. So I may get a gap within that low energy subspace, but it's still valid to uh, work within this 
this framework. Um, okay, so this is uh, maybe the simplest example of the lattice edge theory. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, a basic question you can ask is what more generally, which topological phases have lattice edge theories? And what do those lattice edge theories look like? Um, so to, to um, answer that question, um, there's two useful concepts we need to discuss or review. So one is the notion of a so-called chiral central charge, also called the thermal hall conductance. Um, so what is the chiral central charge? It's a, it's a, a rational number that you, is defined for every topological phase. Um, and it's defined basically by um, looking, one way to define it, maybe the most physical way of defining it is as follows. You take your topological phase, and then you, you imagine that you uh, heat the edge to some temperature T. You put some heat reservoir next to the edge at some temperature T. And then you look at the edge current, the expectation value of the edge current at temperature T. And you can argue on general grounds that this expectation value scales like T squared, and there's some constant here, and that's the chiral central charge. It's a universal number. And, and although it's defined in terms of an edge current, you can argue it depends only on the bulk topological phase. So it's a, really a bulk property of our system, uh, this chiral central charge. And, and, and just for one other thing about it is that this chiral central charge basically counts the number of right moving modes minus the number of left moving modes. So for a, a simple abelian phase, it's always an integer, but for non-abelian phases, this it's, uh, can, it can be uh, rational. rational. Um, okay, so this is the chiral central charge. The other concept that we will is also useful is the concept of kind of the fact that there are really two types of edges uh, that topological phases can have, or, or maybe we can say two types of topological phases. There are topological phases that have gappable edges and topological phases that have ungappable edges. So what do I mean by these two words? So we say a phase has a gappable edge if there's just some local interaction you can add, which will um, which will gap out everything and give you you know a unique ground state and a gap. And we say it's ungappable if there's no local interaction that does that. It's always gapless for any any edge Hamilton. Now, um, two comments about gappable versus ungappable edges. So one is that if you have a non-zero chiral central charge, you can argue that the edge has to be ungappable. And that's basically because uh, that, that formula I wrote before, it, the chiral central charge is telling you about the energy transport at the edge. Uh, and if this is, is non-zero, then uh, there has to be something low energy at the, um, at the edge. There have to be some low energy modes at the edge to carry this energy current, right? So you can make that argument rigorous. Uh, so if, if C minus is different from zero, there's just no way the edge could be fully gapped out and support this, this energy current that we, we just discussed. The other thing that's maybe more non-trivial, and to me at least was a little surprising, is that even if C minus equals zero, um, the edge may or may not be gapped. So you might think if C minus equals zero, there's no reason you can't gap it out. There's no anomaly that one can think about. Uh, but it, it turns out that's not the case. Even if C minus is zero, sometimes you have systems whose edge can be gapped and some systems the edge cannot be gapped. The Tor code is an example where it can be gapped. Later, I'll give some examples with C minus equals zero where, where, where the edge cannot be gapped. And, and the, the, whether it's gappable or not depends on the properties of the bulk anions. So there's a criterion. If you know all the anions and all their statistics, you can determine whether the edge can be gapped or not. Okay, so these are two concepts that will be useful to us. Uh, now that we have these two concepts, one of the most useful things we can do with that is we can kind of classify topological phases into three different categories. So um, one possibility is that one type of phase is, are, are the phases that have vanishing chiral central charge and have a gappable edge. That's like the torque code, for example. Uh, another class of phases are those that have vanishing chiral central charge but have an ungappable edge. I'll give some examples of this in, in a few minutes. And then the third possibility are those that have just a non-zero chiral central charge. That would be like the Laughlin state. Okay, so these are the three uh, logical possibilities. And, uh, and these three possibilities behave somewhat differently with respect to this question. So, so let's talk about whether each of these cases, whether we can get a lattice edge theory. So I'll start with uh, number three here, which is a type three phases. So these are phases with a non-zero chiral central charge. So in this case, I think you can argue probably in many ways that lattice edge theories are, are impossible. You cannot hope to have a lattice edge theory, at least the way I've defined it. Uh, one argument for it is basically, um, you know, having a non-zero chiral central charge means that you're, you have an edge energy current that scales like T squared, 
Um, and you can argue that this behavior is basically inconsistent with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So maybe one argument is basically naive argument, at least, is this behavior here says that uh, the expectation, but let me put it another way finite dimensional Hilbert space implies that your edge energy current is a bounded operator. You can make that, uh, you can argue that. So your edge and your edge energy current has to be, this IE has to be a bounded operator if it's, you're dealing with a kind of a lattice edge theory. But if you look at this, uh, formula here, it looks like if, for, if I make T large, I can make this expectation value arbitrarily large. Um, you can make that argument more precise, but basically that those two things are inconsistent. You can't have something with an energy current that scales like T squared in a finite dimensional Hilbert space where your energy current is a, um, is a bounded operator, you know, whose expectation value is bounded. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so on a lattice, could you imagine a system where the size of the Hilbert space at each side is already infinite? Oh, oh, so you mean like a lattice built out of like quantum rotors? Quantum or rotors. Yeah, you could. Uh, that I'm not going to. Yeah. So my definition, I don't call that a, a lattice, a, a lattice edge theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So that's this whole other separate question. Can one somehow do better if you allow infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces on site? I don't know. Yes. Oh, that's okay. okay. So th in this case, I think one can argue that we just shouldn't expect to have any lattice edge theories. The other kind of limit is kind of, this is kind of the, these are kind of the hardest phases. I kind of organize them from easiest to hardest, right? So these are the hardest ones. There's no way we can get lattice edge theory. The easiest ones up here. And in that case, one can actually argue that yes, we can get lattice edge theories. And in fact, for all of these phases, there's strong reasons to believe we should be able to construct lattice edge theories for all of these. And the reason is that all of these phases, at least are, are strongly believed, there's a kind of conjecture, I would say, uh, which says that all phases with gappable edge, they can always be realized by something called string net models, which are some kind of exactly solvable spin models. You can think of them as generalizations of the Tor code. And just like the Tor code has a lattice edge theory, these models, which are exactly solvable lattice models, you can construct, you can construct a lattice edge theory for all of them. It's, it's not hard. So as long as this is true, that these can be realized by string net models, then it, it follows we can we'll be able to build a lattice edge theory for all of them. So this case is easy, this case is hard. So then the question is, what about the middle case? Um, do there exist lattice edge theories in this case? And, um, and that's sort of the main point, the main question uh, in this talk. And um, so do type two topological phases, these are phases that have ungappable boundaries, but vanishing chiral central charge. Um, can they support lattice edge theories? And, uh, and the answer is, I, I think, at least to me, it was a little bit surprising. Yes, they can. I, 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 we can't, and what I'm going to tell you is how to construct, or I'm going to tell you what lattice edge theories look like for some of them. I, I don't, we haven't constructed lattice edge theories for all of them, but for, for, for a large class of them, basically all the abelian ones, we think we know how to do it. So, um, okay, so that's our main result. So our main result is I'm going to tell you about a collection of lattice edge theories for a, a family of abelian topological phases. Um, and this family will include both type two and type one. So uh, the type two are the more interesting ones because they're the ones that wasn't obvious how to construct edge theories. But as a side product, we also get edge theories for some type one phases as well. Okay, so, um, so what are the phases? What's this family of phases that we're going to uh, work with, it's kind of the simplest camp family of abelian phases that has a vanishing chiral central charge. So one way to think about it is uh, the kind of phases we're thinking about are equivalent to taking two Laughlin states um, with opposite chiralities. So this is so one, we have one Laughlin state, one over K1, and another Laughlin state, which is minus one over K2. Um, so you can think of it as a bilayer. Of course, physically, you wouldn't build it this way in a lab. But from the point of view of its topological data, it's equivalent to kind of a bilayer of two Laughlin states at, different, at two different filling fractions and with opposite magnetic fields, OK? Um, in some special cases, as I'll explain, this, these phases are more physically relevant. than for, for some choices of K1 and K2, they're very physically relevant. But for general choice of K1 and K2, it's hard to, to realize them, probably. So, um, so this, in terms of if you prefer a field theory description, the phases I'm thinking about are those described by U1 cross U1 and Simon's theory, where one U1 is at level K1 and the other is at minus K2. And all of these phases have vanishing chiral central charge. That's kind of the point. It's kind of the simplest phases. They have vanishing chiral central charge because they have their edge modes go in opposite directions. So they kind of cancel. The total, total chiral central charge is zero. Okay. So um, 
Uh, so first I should tell you of this class of phases, which ones are type one and which ones are type two. So I'll just tell you kind of the answer it may seem a little bit mysterious, but it turns out the type one phases, those which whose edge can be gapped, those course, that's the case where K one times K two is a perfect square. Uh, and the type two phases, the ones that whose edge cannot be gapped, those are the cases where K one times K two is not a perfect square. And just, um, kind of, yeah, that may be a little mysterious. I'm not gonna derive that for you, but you can, given, I told you, we have some understanding of when these edges can be gapped or not based on statistics in the bulk. And you can work out that when it's a perfect square, it can be gapped. And when it's not a perfect square, it cannot, cannot be gapped. Yes. So there's no requirement that K1, K2 are even. Both the balls are fermion, it's okay. This oh, uh, no, I'm just gonna do the case where they're both, they're both odd, fermion. But that's not for any deep reason. It's just because it's a slightly, as you'll see in a second, it's slightly easier to connect it to some a system you've heard of. But this statement applies for both both on that case and the oh, oh, the case statement I made here is, is true in both cases. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I, but everything I'm going to say is going to be in the all the models are going to be in the case where they're odd. It's not a big deal, but just for to be concrete, I'm focusing on the case where they're odd. So they're fermionic systems. Uh, so okay, just as an example, two cannot examples. So an example of a type one phase would be this one nine phase. And an example of the type two phase would be the one three phase because one times three is not a perfect square. Both of these actually um, do have natural physical realization. So the one three phase actually is equivalent to the two thirds quantum Hall state, uh, part of the whole conjugate of the one third state. So you can show that this, that these, that this term science theory describes this state, or it's at least strongly believed. Uh, and the eight ninth state is a kind of hypothetical state, hasn't been seen experimentally, but it would be the particle whole conjugate of the one ninth state. And again, that's that's one way to think about this uh, this example. So the two thirds state has an ungappable edge, and eighth ninth state has a gappable edge. If we break all symmetries, okay, so we're not dealing with charge conservation symmetry at this point. We're imagining we can break all symmetries. Okay, so these are um, sort of two canonical examples, and our construction will construct last edge theories for all of them. In particular, both of these, let's say both of these cases. So how does our um, how do we derive our lattice edge theories? So our, our strategy is basically we start from a known, the, the standard kind of chiral boson edge theory. And then that, that chiral boson edge theory is gapless. Okay, so it isn't easy to kind of pick out some finite dimensional Hilbert space from that, you know, to separate out some finite dimensional edge theory Hilbert space. So what we, our strategy is to kind of try to gap out degrees of freedom in this theory. So we add some, what I'll call impurity scattering terms. I'll show you what those are in a second. And that gives us something called an impurity model. And these extra terms that we add in, they gap out lots of modes. In fact, it turns out that they gap out in the limit of strong scattering. So we're actually going to take the scattering to be, in, yes, we take the limit where it's infinitely strong. In the limit of strong scattering, what happens is all the phonon modes basically get gapped out. This theory is a theory of gapless phonon modes, but they all get gapped out. And then all that's left is ground state degeneracy, which grows with the system size, okay? And this ground state degeneracy, that's going to be the edge theory for our Hilbert space. Yes? I have a question about terminology. So in an earlier slide, you say this model is ungappable. Meaning untrivially gappable. Oh, so ungappable means you can't get a unique ground state. So, so this doesn't count because, uh, because we have an ex extensive ground Got state it. degeneracy. Got it. There's debatable if I have like a finite ground state degeneracy, what I should call that. I personally would call that gap. But, but anyway, this, this case is not that. This case is uh, an extensive ground state degeneracy. It scales exponentially with this circumference. So I wouldn't call this, yeah, it's, we gap out some degrees of freedom, but we have not gapped the edge. There's a whole Hilbert space left behind, which is our edge theory. Okay, so that's the kind of the strategy. Now let me just, I'm not gonna take it through in detail, but just I'll sketch a little bit how it works. So let's start with the chiral boson edge theory. So the, this is the standard chiral boson edge theory, and it's just a sum of two copies of that Laughlin edge theory I wrote down for you. So you have two fields, phi one and phi two, that describe the two counter propagating edge modes, one corresponding k one, one corresponding k two. Um, they obey these commutation algebra. I didn't write down the boundary conditions, but there's also two boundary conditions, global boundary conditions, like before. And the local operators, the electron operators, again, they're written in this form, e to the i, k2, phi2, that's the electron operator on this mode. And e to the minus i, k1, phi1, that's the electron operator on this mode. And now, now I'm going to introduce the Hamiltonian, because I'm, I'm really trying to, uh, as I said, 
introduce some dynamics and gap out some degrees of freedom. So the Hamiltonian I want to think about is this is sort of the standard power of the Hamiltonian. It uh, describes these gapless phonon modes. I've set the velocity. In general, you can have different velocities for your two modes. But for simplicity, I've chosen all the velocities to be the same. So both the right and left moving modes have the same velocity, just for simplicity. So that's our system, and it's gapless. So now what we want to do is, is try to gap out degrees of freedom and get this lattice-like edge theory. So how are we going to do that? So we're going to add in scattering terms or, uh, that scatter particles between our electrons between our two modes. The idea is that by scattering, if we don't by scattering particles between these two modes, we can hope we can try to gap out uh, the phonons. And uh, I'm at, and now what the way I'm going to introduce scattering is sometimes people introduce scattering, like in real physical systems, they usually introduce scattering everywhere in space, maybe with some random coefficient. But for simplicity, or we, to facilitate our solution of the model, the way we do is we only introduce scattering at discrete points. That's why we call it impurity scattering. So the only we'll, we'll introduce a, a backscattering term like this, but only at this point in space. Okay. So we'll have like a term like this, but only at, at some particular point in space. And, and, and uh, that's what these are. So they're, they're like localized uh, scattering terms. I'll write down what, they're, what they look like in a second in terms of the, the edge theory. Uh, and importantly, we're going to need two different types of scattering terms. So this is conventional backscattering term. It scatters an electron from mode one uh, to mode two and vice versa. And this is another kind of scattering you could think of as coming from a superconducting impurity, which would scatter. It's actually more of a pairing term. It scatters an electron from one mode to a hole on the other mode. And you know, the Cooper pair going into the superconductor. So, uh, and the reason we need both types of impurities is you can easily argue, for example, you only have this kind of impurity, there's no way you can gap out the phonon modes because basically because you have this Hall conductance. And this is charge conserving. So you kind of have to break charge conservation. So you need this one. Uh, and uh, you can argue you really need both if you want to have any hope of gapping out the phonon modes. So we, we use both and we use them in an alternating pattern. Um, and, 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 and evenly spaced. So they have some separation S. Okay, so that's our model. And we have two N of them. I guess that's going to be important because that's going to set kind of the size of our Hilbert space. We have two N of these impurities. Uh, uh, but when we take the thermodynamic limit, we'll kind of keep the spacing S fixed. So N is going to scale with the circumference. Okay, so what does this look like as a Hamiltonian? Uh, the Hamiltonian we're considering is our original Hamiltonian plus these backscattering terms. So these backscattering terms, if you convert them into this phi language, they correspond to cosine terms because this gives you something like e to the i phi 1, k1 phi 1 plus uh, k2 phi 2, and this is e to the i k1 phi 1 minus k2 phi 2. And so you get this, uh, and then you add a Hermitian conjugate, they turn to cosine. So you get these cosine terms, and they're, this, you can see they're only evaluated at particular points in space, multiples of s. S is the spacing. And they have an alternating sign here that just says that we go red, blue, red, blue, we alternate. So this is the system we want to study. And the, um, the idea is what's special about the system is, uh, well, uh, well, we're going to study it in the limit where U basically goes to infinity. OK, so uh, you could think of it as infinite scattering limit. And in that limit, you can solve this problem exactly. So uh, I'm not going to explain that in detail, but actually, it's very general. Any quadratic system where you add cosine terms with large coefficients in the limit that you send u to infinity it's basically can be solved exactly because you can treat these cosines as basically a constraints on h not on on the fields and uh it, it, it's basically a quadratic problem roughly speaking with constraints so you can solve it um so let me tell you what you get so when you solve this in the limit e goes to infinity, you get a picture like this. So you find a phonon spectrum, which you can compute exactly. It's like a band structure calculation. Um, and you find that actually the phonons are gapped. So the phonon spectrum is gapped. Um, but below that gap, you find some uh, degenerate ground states. And the number of ground states scales exponentially with n, which is kind of the circumference of our system. And it scales exponentially. Uh, so this is the actual exact formula for the ground state degeneracy, but maybe the term that dominates is this first term. So this term, this grows, um, this term is larger, this number is larger than this. So the limit the n goes to infinity, the asymptotic behavior is this number, which is generally irrational, raised to the nth power divided by this prefactor. So this is going to be the, um, our, the dimension of our Hilbert space, because as I told you before, our low energy Hilberts, our edge theory is going to be built out of these ground states, basically. Um, Yes. Have you gone this by counting the shortest possible jumps between 
allowed stakes at the scatterers? Um, not short as possible jumps. I mean, you're asking how we get this degeneracy? Well, I'm asking what the ground states look like. Oh, yeah, yeah, them? the ground states do have, um, they are kind of piecewise. Um, piecewise yeah. linear, but you want them to have the slope as small as possible. Um, yeah, I have to think about it in that language. I'm not sure I can answer off the top of my head, think about it in that language, but, but the, um, let's see. Let's it see. looks like at each scatterer, there are a finite number of allowed points you want to be, or maybe it's a finite number of circles. Um, and then you have to jump from one to the next. So the way, I, maybe I can just tell you how we calculate this degeneracy, it's, um, let's see how I should answer that. It, it's, um, yeah, we do it, uh, Yeah, maybe it's going to take me too far afield, actually. But no, no. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, no, it, it, we don't calculate, but I think you probably can think about it that way. But but okay, I'll just tell you mathematically, we get this by calculating the determinant of a certain matrix, which is the commutator. So it turns out, maybe I'll just say one word about it. When you deal with Hamiltonians like this, when the arguments of the cosine term do not commute, so in general, these arguments of the cosine term, they, they don't commute in these theories. So they don't commute, but they do, their commutator is always a multiple of, of two pi i, I think, if I remember correctly. That, that, that's because the cosines have to commute, right? Those are local operators, but the arguments do not have to commute. And in, in, in particular, this theory, they do not commute. And so if you've just generally solved quadratic problems, just a very general formula, formal calculation where you have cosines, where the, where the arguments of the cosines are functions of x, linear functions of say x and p, which don't commute with each other, and you work it out, you'll find a ground state degeneracy. And the ground state degeneracy can be calculated by taking the commutator matrix. You take the commutator between the i constraint and the j constraint. That gives you a big 2n by 2n matrix. And then that's a skew symmetric matrix, and you take the Pfaff unit of matrix. That's the degeneracy. That's just a general formula you can prove, but maybe it's not. Uh, Maybe it's not so intuitive, but that's that's what you find if you just solve this very general problem of quadratic Hamiltonians with cosine terms which don't commute. Um, is there another question? Yeah, um, yeah. Make sure I understand the, the the steps. So we start with a continuum edge described by the bosons, and then we introduce MP impurities. So that kind of effectively make it a lattice model. And the last step, take, taking n to infinity is like another. No, I'm not going to take n to infinity. Okay. But, but you did say several times that you want to take n. Oh, well, I think all I'm, all I'm explaining is whenever you study any model, whether it's a lattice model or not, you usually are interested in its behavior in a thermodynamic limit. So I'm just explaining when you take, when you consider that thermodynamic limit, the limit, the proper way to take the thermodynamic limit is to take, keep S fixed and, and, and consider larger and larger circumference. It's the natural, yeah, you want to keep S fixed and consider larger and larger circumference. And so my statement about, um, yeah, that's the only statement I want to make. That's the proper way to take the thermodynamic limit. I don't want to take, keep a finite circumference and then send, uh, take N to infinity for a finite circumference. That's not what I want to consider. It's not a local Hamiltonian, right? I mean, it's got these things that- no, This is a local it. Hamiltonian. What's not local? Once you go to your ground state, the other subspaces, I mean, the degrees of freedom are not local, they are anti commute Oh yeah, they, the, the degrees, so I'll give you the grounds, I'm gonna give you the edge theory in a second, but um, so let's see what I wanna say. Um, I'm not sure how to say whether it's local or not, but the, you, you'll see that the Hilbert space structure is a little bit non-trivial. Yeah. Can you put the formula with N, the next slide? Yes. So I have two questions. First, let's substitute N equals one. Yes. Is it an integer? Yes, the square roots cancel. I mean, so this is a general. Um, right, so I have K1 plus K1. Oh, wait. Ah, did I make a mistake here? Let me see. I probably did. See a uh, minus sign? You need a minus sign. Oh, you know what? I probably have a minus yeah. sign. Sorry. That's the answer to my first question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, my second question. Your goal was to show that you can gap it. Right? So gap the phonons. Yeah, so why do we need. Arbitrary n, can we just substitute n equals one and then we're done? No, because the size of the gap, I didn't say this, but the size of the gap scales like velocity. There's only one kind of natural energy scale here apart from u, which we're sending to infinity. So the size of the gap is v divided by s. That's what, I mean, that's what you find, the size of the phonon gap. 
the size of the phonon gap. It's sort of, um, uh, it's kind of, maybe you could have guessed it by dimensional analysis. It, it scales like V divided by S. So if we want to keep a finite gap, finite phonon gap, uh, we have to uh, keep S fixed, which is also natural. I mean, when you're taking the thermodynamic limit, you usually, um, usually deal with a kind of translation invariant system and you scale. Started already in the, you started already in the continuum. Then there's a continuum question of whether you can gap it or not. That, that's where I your talk so far. And with n equals one, you already gap it. I think. n equals one. So what is n equals one here? You mean just two impurities? Yeah. If I only add two impurities and I solve this problem, we can solve it exactly for any choice of n. I, what I would find there is the same picture, but with very few ground states, because I'd only have n equals whatever, one or two. And then the gap would be, v, would be um, uh, v over the system size, V over L, right? The spacing in that case between your two impurities would be like half the circumference, right? So the gap in that case would be like V over L. I wouldn't call that a gap system, right? That's, that's the usual phonon space, in fact, is V over L. I need to have a finite energy gap in the kind of in the uh, fixed energy gap, a uniform energy gap in the limit of larger and larger circumference to be able to kind of project to this space uh, you know, to make that a, a well-defined thing to do. It's just like a Landau level. You need to have that finite energy gap between the, the lowest Landau level and the, you want to keep the magnetic field fixed as you right, consider larger and larger system sizes. So does that answer your question? Okay, so, okay, so the, I, I realize I'm not telling you all the details, but yeah, it's just a, you can just solve these quadratic Hamiltonians with cosine terms, it's uh, not really that hard, and you get this ground state degeneracy, and now I'll just tell you what the, the and the, this is going to be our Hilbert space, okay, uh, which, which is now it's a good choice of Hilbert space, because it's really the low energy Hilbert space. I've proven to you, I think, that it's a physical low energy theory, because it, it, it's the low energy Hilbert space of this particular Hamiltonian. It may not be a very natural Hamiltonian, but it is a physical Hamiltonian. So it's low energy Hilbert space is, is a, gives us a physical edge theory. So what is the edge theory? So actually the easiest way to describe it is actually algebraic, just like I described the Laughlin edge theory. So I'll just tell you what the operators are and what their algebra is. So the operators, it turns out we have two N kind of basic local operators, one for each impurity. Um, I'll, maybe I can tell you physically what they mean in a second. Um, uh, well, maybe I can just say that physically these U operators, they correspond to instant time tunneling terms. So, you know, when you add this U goes to infinity, these arguments of the cosines get locked to you know, multiples of two pi, but you can have kind of, you can have a tunneling from like two pi, to, you can switch it by multiple, you can shift it by two pi. And those U terms, each U term is corresponds to tunneling, that two pi tunneling term for the, for the I impurity. That's just the physical interpretation. So you should really think of them as some kind of local operator in space corresponding to the ith impurity. And what, what are their algebra of, of, that they obey? So they're all they're unitary operators. They don't, this, this is very important, they don't commute with each other. Uh, even nearby impurities don't quite commute. So I'll explain this in a second. They commute up to some phase, which is this, determined by this matrix gamma ij, which I'll write down in a second. Gamma ij is a matrix that depends on k1 and k2. Um, and then they obey some other algebra uh, here, which is just uh, alpha and beta are just some combinations of K1 and K2. And then finally, there's some global boundary condition. This is just like the boundary condition we wrote down for the Laughlin state. There's some global boundary condition we always get in these edge theories. So the, this, this, this algebraic description actually tells you everything. So the Hilbert space is basically the unique DN dimensional representation of this algebra. That's our Hilbert space. Um, and so this defines your edge theory completely. All I have to tell you is what this gamma matrix is. So let me tell you that. So the gamma matrix, again, the deals the don't matter, but the, here's the formula for it. It's, a, it's some matrix that depends on I and J. Maybe the most important thing is it only depends on the distance between I and J. So uh, it's kind of, our edge theory is kind of translationally invariant. The, uh, the commutator between UI and UJ just depends on the distance, not which I and J you're dealing with. And um, it's defined in terms of this number x. Maybe the most, it, it simplifies a lot if you consider the limit n goes to infinity. This is like considering the system on a circle. Taking n goes to infinity is kind of like considering the system on a line. And that limit, this, you can ignore this second term, so just the first term matters. You take the ratio and you just get this very, almost the simplest thing you could get. 
uh, the commutator is varies exponentially with the distance with some exponent x and some prefactor beta. And uh, where x and beta are determined by k1 and k2. Um, so, so this is it. This is your whole edge theory. Um, and yeah, maybe the point here is these UIs, they don't commute, but they commute as you get, it's still a local theory because they commute approximately uh, uh, to within exponentially small error as you get further and further away. This is always the case when you project below a gap system. You tr to tr what you often find is that the commutator doesn't, this is exactly zero between two local operators, but it decays exponentially with the distance. Let me just give you one example just to make it more concrete. So in this case, this is this uh, two thirds case, the one three theory. So what do these, these uh, dimensions look like? They, this is the, the degeneracy for you know, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, some sequence like this. Um, and then what does this um, gamma matrix look like? So here's the case of, of eight impurities and it's four. So in the case of eight impurities, we have a Hilbert space, which is 112 dimensional. And then I have to tell you how all the different UIs commute or don't. That's determined by an eight by eight matrix, which I've shown here. And you can see this kind of exponential behavior sort of right that nearby. This is the kind of commutator between U1 and U2. So it's pretty big. This is U1 and U3, U1 and U4. This goes to zero uh, and then comes back up and you go all the way around the circle. So this just gives you a flavor. And then if you were to take the limit n goes to infinity, so you're kind of dealing with an infinite chain, then the commutator is just this very simple formula, just two plus root three. Uh, so it's irrational uh, number, uh, but, it, but it scales like this. So this tells you the commutator between two UIs separated by distance uh, uh, I minus J, uh, between UI and UJ. Okay, so, um, so you can see already the Hilbert space structure is not as simple as this um, uh, Tor code uh, example, but I do wanna make one comment, which is that there's a special case, maybe I should just make this one comment. Uh, it may look really mysterious and complicated, but there's a special case where things simplify a lot and become familiar. If you take the case where K1 equals K2, uh, so uh, that's a particular kind of type one phase, uh, and you work out all these things, you find that UIs have a completely local commutation algebra, and it becomes a very familiar, it's a known, um, it's very similar to basically the Tor code case, uh, just written in an algebraic language. You find that the UIs only, they commute unless they're nearest neighbors, basically, and they their commutators just you know, e to the pi i over k or something like that. It's very very simple, but in the generic case, you get this kind of um, uh, uh, slightly more non-local commutation structure. Okay, so um, the, I just the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was kind of a concrete question. So one of the nice things you can do when you have these kind of uh, finite dimensional edge theories is you can really investigate their gapability in a very concrete way. So, the, so let's, that's what I want to talk about. So, you know, the expectation, as I told you before, is that if K1, K2 is a perfect square, you can find some gap in Hamiltonian. But if it's not a perfect square, this such a Hamiltonian does not exist. And in this context, it's a very concrete statement. It says any, any function of the UIs, basically, any local function of the UIs will always have a gapless spectrum. Any local, any polynomial in the UIs that's sort of local in space um, will always have a gapless spectrum unless this is a perfect square, in which case some of them have a gap spectrum. So let's investigate that. So we can start with this case, one nine theory. We can ask, can we construct a gap in Hamiltonian in this case? And um, the answer is yes, you can. I'll just sort of flash you what it looks like. So it's a sum of terms built out of the UIs and they've been chosen in some particular way so that they all commute. So it turns out for this case, and actually I think it's pretty general for all those type one theories, you can find some combination to use that they all commute. And then because they all commute, you can basically solve it exactly, compute the gap exactly, show it's finite. So you can gap it in, in, in analytically. What about this, this other case, the one three case? Can we find a gap in Hamiltonian here? So um, the expectation is we can't, right? But let's see what happens if we try. So the first thing you could try to do is look for commuting Hamiltonian, like this H gap Hamiltonian, which is by commuting, I mean a sum of terms that each commute. So if you look for a Hamiltonian that's literally like this, composed out of kind of sums of monomials in the use, where the monomials commute with each other, um, you find uh, that just 
you can't find, they don't, they don't exist. So there's no monomial type Hamiltonian uh, built out of monomials where they all commute. That just doesn't exist in a one, three case. That all those monomial type terms, they kind of don't commute with themselves when they're translated in space. So there's no way to build at least a translationally invariant commuting Hamiltonian like the one I wrote before in this uh, for one three. Of course, this doesn't prove that one can't gap it by some more complicated Hamiltonian. All I'm saying is that the simplest type of Hamiltonian, like the one in that previous example, that, you, that, that isn't gonna work. So the next thing you could try to do is ask, can I, what if I just look at some non-commuting Hamiltonian? And so we tried that. So we picked the kind of simplest non-commuting Hamiltonian you can write down, which is just this, this one here, UI plus UI dagger. This is a non-trivial, because remember the UIs don't commute with each other. So this is an interacting Hamiltonian, although it looks like it's single, bo single body operators. And so this, of course, since it's non-commuting, we can't do much with this analytically, but we saw that we basically did exact diagonalization on this. And I just want to show you um, for one, one result that we had, which was we plotted the energy gap as a function of system size. We did it for two different cases. Of, um, uh, and both of these are type two theories. So they both, they get, both gaps should be zero. And of course, we can only go up to system sizes of n equals eight, which corresponds to 16 impurities. But you can kind of see, at least for the one five theory, actually, you can kind of see one over n scaling. I, I don't have, I, I didn't prepare slides on this, but well, I, I do have slides on this, but I, I don't have them right now. Um, but you can actually, this one over n scaling is real. In fact, the one five Hamiltonian, it looks like it's a conformal field theory. It's the chiral, it's a chiral boson field theory, in fact, emerges. The one three case, um, the gap seems to be kind of going to zero, but it's not scaling in a simple way. And in fact, we don't really know what this one, three, it's some gapless theory, but we don't know what it is. It doesn't look like a conformal field theory. So it's kind of a mystery actually. But anyway, maybe the punchline is that it's gapless as expected. Um, the, the, um, uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to say, um, was I just want to close with a kind of remark uh, slash question, which I think is interesting, which is that um, this may relate to what Sudhir was saying earlier, which is that our edge theories, um, they don't have a tensor product structure, or at least not an obvious tensor product structure. Like if you look at that uh, Tor code edge theory, it was a tensor product Hilbert space with a constraint. So it wasn't literally a tensor product Hilbert space, but it was a tensor product Hilbert space with constraints. Our edge theories don't seem to have that structure. Like, at least as far as we can tell, there's no way to write them, except in a very special case where K1 equals K2. There's no way to write them as a tensor product with constraints. And, um, and so I, I'm, I wonder whether, yeah, that could be a general property of these type two edges. So for type one edges, we know using string net or Tor code like constructions, we can build kind of tensor product like Hilbert spaces with constraints. But for the type two edges, this is the only construction I know. And I sort of wonder whether maybe that's a general property that these edges, one of the things that distinguishes them from the other cases is that they don't, they're incompatible with the tensor product structure. At least if you want to define a commercial. Our uh, tensor product with constraints. Um, so yeah, that's uh, all I had to say. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Okay. Yeah, you have this uh, commutator with decay exponentially. I wonder, can you modify that so to have a finite, uh, finite range? Or yes. whether this, the, the, maybe the structure can remain the same? Uh, similar result. But what do you mean by modify? Just by hand? Just... Uh, yeah, this is uh, some, because this one have a tail, whether there's a the finite, uh, just finite, exactly finite range. Uh, um, well, and, uh, you just, have a similar result. Okay, so maybe what you're saying is, could you by hand just say, it's not really, you're not really deriving it, but just say, oh, let me just postulate that this finite range one is a good edge theory. Yeah. Well, there might be some problems with making it consistent, at least in a certain, when you put it on a circle, right, there are a lot of constraints. And, you know, so I don't know if you could just truncate it and it can be consistent. Um, um, but um, on an infinite line, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure you could make it consistent and still have a finite dimensional, like have all the help. Because the way we define our theory is as a representation of this yeah. algebra, right? So it, because it's defined in that kind of algebraic way, if you change the commutation algebra, like such a, you know, maybe it these may not even, these relations won't even be consistent. So for example, there's a consistency between this relation and this relation, which is that this combination of U's 
commutes with every other U. It has to, right? Because it's equal to identity. So there's a consistency condition between gamma, beta, and alpha, right? So you can't just change gamma at will. Because this would no longer be a well defined. So the concern is that if you modify this uh, computation relation a little bit, maybe the representation immediately became very big. Uh, I may not even be, it doesn't have any, there's no representation. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 you, if gamma doesn't have, if gamma is not consistent with this, then there's no solution, right? There's, there wouldn't be any solution. Not just that it'd be big, there just wouldn't be a representation. So it's it'd be, it'd be in, algebraically inconsistent. Algebraic inconsistent. So yeah, there's a lot of constraints on these gamma. So it's not clear you can just. Um, but it is true, actually. Um, uh, well, yeah. you can try. Yeah, you can try to guess. And in retrospect, you can kind of almost guess this structure by looking for consistent algebraic relations. Basically, like you don't have to go through that whole step that we went through. You might be able to just kind of guess it as a consistent algebraic structure. Um, yes. Um, there's a naive question. So, do you expect these uh, fact that one of these systems to be described by kind of usual non chiral CFTs that were used in usual 1D? Well, they're not going to be non chiral. So they're going to be like, they're going to be um, CFTs with chiral central charge zero, but it depends on what you mean by non chiral. They'll have chiral central charge zero, zero, but they won't necessarily be built out of a left and right sector that are just. Um, in uh, time reverse partners. So in fact, this one five theory, I, I didn't say it, but I have, we have numerical data. I, I took out the slide because I thought I'd run out of time. But this last data here, ah, I need to figure out how to do this better. Yeah, like I have, um, I have a, some data which shows the energy spectrum of this and it looks exactly like the chiral boson theory we started with, H naught, that, that particular. So this, it, there's a lot strong evidence that for this theory, actually, we just went back to where we started. You know, we started with the chiral boson edge theory, we gapped out the phonon modes, and then we tried to split the degeneracy, you know, of these low lying states. And then the low energy states, they, re they reformed the original chiral boson theory. Back. Like, I, I, th this data doesn't, shows one over n scaling, but if you look at uh, more data, you actually can, can see, you get the one five theory back. So yeah, I, that's an example of one of the chiral, one of the conformal field theories that might emerge. But this theory, it's not, doesn't seem to match any Conformal field theory or any theory I know, actually. So it's kind of a mystery. Uh, yes? Um, so, can you write the electron operator in terms of your use? Is it just. Uh, right. The fermion, no. So, it, it, I think the electron operator is not. Well, electron operator isn't local, but um, it, so, but if you wanted any. Um, so, the ele electron operator doesn't have a simple, can't be written in terms of the use. So, I, yeah, there's one subtlety in this edge theory that I skipped over, which is that there's two sectors with even fermion parity and odd fermion parity, and you can't get between those two sectors with the U's, which of course makes sense because U's are local. local yes. So if I fix a bulk type two homological holder, so we know the boundary theory has to have vanishing chiral central charge, but do you think there could be some interesting lower thumb on the total chiral central charge? Of the boundary conformal field. Um, oh, you're saying right. Um, if it's if it is a conformal field theory, yeah, if it is a conformal yeah, field. maybe yeah. I, I think that that's kind of one of the questions I have is sort of what types of gapless theories are consistent with one of these systems. And like this one, maybe I should show you the spectrum. It's just so crazy. In case someone has an idea, I'll look at it, try to find it. Um, I know I'm probably well done, but I just want to show you this for a second. This is the one that's that's um, the one that matches our local theory. So this is the one five theory. And I mean, you can see that one, one, two, three, there are five states here. And you can match this perfectly with the original one five chiral boson theory. So this is what we get in the one five case. But in the, um, so it looks like this. But in the one three case, it's just, I have no idea what this is. This is the spectrum we get. So. These are the two lowest lying states. The gap I was plotting was the difference between these two states. And it just, it doesn't seem to look like a conformal field theory. And it also seems like we tried perturbing it. We still got stuff that kind of garbage spectrums like this. So we don't know what this is. It's weird. Well, in the last slide, did you see both the left and right moving modes? Yes, good, you're quick. Yeah, yeah, so they are here. So you can mostly see this one, like one, one, two, three, five. So we see the first hint of the right moving mode. So we think this is it because up here, we can see again one, one, two, 
So we think this is the, we think this mode has a much higher velocity than this mode. Actually, it's five times higher, roughly. We don't know if that's an, an accident, but yeah, we're not positive. We believe it seems to match. We see one, one, two, and we actually also see some zero modes. So this theory has some zero modes and they occur at exactly this momentum and they come in a fourfold multiplet. So everything seems to match at least within our limited numerics to this, this theory. But yeah, yeah, one of the modes has a much lower velocity than the other. So you can only mostly see the left moving mode just a little bit. We can only see the first excitation of the right moving mode. The second excitation is probably up here somewhere. That's what we think. Is, that's our interpretation. Um, Shane. So, um, does it make sense to think about the Hilbert space kind of like a bunch of non-abelian anions, just because the way they scale up? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Actually, in that case, does is the operator algebra can it has can it have tails like that? Right, yeah, so that's very good. So like this structure in the case where K1 is equal to K2. So in the case where K1 is equal to K2, the way you're thinking about it, I think is exactly right. And in fact, that case people have studied before, probably many people in the audience may know if you take, that's like a quantum spin, fractional quantum spin hall state with superconductors and ferromagnets, alternating superconductors and ferromagnets. That's all very similar to what we're studying here. And they get a gap and they get a ground state degeneracy that scales exponentially. And they get an algebra that looks like algebra we have, but, but strictly local. Like the UIs only commute, only fail to commute with their neighbors. And it kind of, there's some, a lot of similarities with non-abelian anions kind of, um, you can kind of think of it as a chain of non-abelian anions in that case. But, but in the case where K1 is not equal to K2, I don't have such an interpretation. Uh, I, it's possible there's some connection, but one thing I should mention is unlike those two cases are very different because the case K1 is equal to K2, the, you can, uh, the, this model that we've studied is very similar to another model that I just mentioned to you, where we basically, you gap out the edge in two different ways in the alternating pattern. So it's actually built out of look short segments of gapped boundaries. So everything is gapped. And then you just get a ground state degeneracy because you're putting these different gap boundaries together in some pattern. This case, there's no such interpretation like as terms of a, the whole system has a phonon gap, but you can't think of it as like alternating gap segments. So because of that, I don't have a simple interpretation in terms of kind of a similar interpretation to the case K1 equals K2. Yeah. Can you describe all that in terms of boundary conditions on the U1 gauge fields in the bulk? Um, I mean, like I, the the, the so cosine terms, terms or something. Guess that for K one equals K two, you can have some kind of boundary conditions. A one equals A two, maybe. Yeah. Minus. Or A one equals A. Yeah, something like that. Possibly. Something like that. So for the other cases, which are less, and that obviously gaps. Yeah. Uh, which basically means that the modes are reflected. Yes. Of the boundary, but for the other cases where K one is not equal to K two, is there a similar boundary condition? Um. Well, the, the boundary conditions, that's what I'm saying, um, they're not gapped. I mean, especially in general, these theories don't even have a gapped boundary, right? So you can't think of them as like um, some top, they're not topological boundary conditions, let's put it that way. Because I, if I understood correctly, the way people define topological boundary conditions, at least in all the cases I know, they correspond to true gapped boundaries. Okay, so and let's take they don't have gap boundaries, so they can't have topological boundary conditions. In the case where K1 times K, K1 is not equal to K2, where the product is a square. Oh, in that case, right. So in that case, there are topological boundary conditions, but we've chosen the kind of non-topological ones, I think, in this pattern. So for example, with two and eight. Yeah. The, yeah, you could choose some impurities that uh, would gap it out in a, in a much easier way. You only need one type of impurity. That would correspond to the topological boundary condition and everything. But we've chosen this way that even in the case where K1 times K2 is a perfect square, it's not that, that uh, topological boundary condition. You may say, why? Why did you choose a more complicated one? The reason is because we wanted to cover the other case. We, kind of, we weren't really interested in the type one case. That kind of was just a side effect. Uh, so we've chosen kind of non-topological boundary conditions. We've just chosen kind of um, because we wanted to cover both cases. Yeah. Even in this case, when it's not a perfect square, you could ask whether you could you can do the whole thing directly in the continuum. In some boundary conditions, perhaps some boundary interactions on the boundary. Rather than you've already been in the continuum and you've artificially introduced a lattice in order to gap it. Yes. 
So I'm, my question is really whether you can do the whole thing directly in the continuum. In the continuum. Well, I don't know how to do that. I mean, because especially here, the ground state degeneracy sort of scales with the number of points. So you could, if you try to take a continuum limit by adding more and more impurity scatters, you would get an infinite ground state degeneracy in a finite system. And you get a gap that goes to zero. So I don't quite know how to do that. But yeah, it's a good question. Do we have to do this kind of, is there a way to do it? I don't know. The other thing is we're using an alternating pattern. I don't quite know how to do that in a continuum. But yeah, if you could, I guess the naive thing is you could introduce both those two types of terms kind of comp, you know, with the same coefficient or something. You hope that you could get the same physics. I, I don't know how to do that. Um, yeah. Well, I have no more questions, not even in Zoom. Not one question. Just maybe a quick follow-up question to what was already asked. So if K1 is equal to K2, can you still use your formula for the degeneracy of the ground state? Uh, yes, you can. So, but you have to take the limit. So I probably, that minus sign is probably important. So the, the, some things are going to, let's see. Yeah, if I remember correctly, some things go to zero, but you get a ratio of two zeros maybe. Let me see. If you take the limit, you get a well-defined answer. Um, but I really need to look at this. I'm worried that I had a typo there, so I'm not sure I'd give you the right point. Let's see. Um, so let's see. If you take K1 equals K2, um, what happens? Um, it's a perfect square. Right. So this one just becomes zero, right? So then you get, yeah, then you get this very simple behavior, which is known. It just becomes. This just becomes um, k plus k. Let's say k1 equals k2 equals k. You get 2k to the nth power divided by k. That's the known scaling for these systems. It scales in a very simple way, and that's kind of related to um, yeah, the fact that it has this very simple tensor product with Hilbert space structure. Uh, this is the case we should, we should be able to get. Well, all the cases, yeah, that's a particular case. That's the case, all the cases where it's a perfect square, you can gap it. But the case where k1 equals k2, the terms we've chosen are kind of the top lot, the, the nice ones. But, but so this is the case when we can think of these as uh, a bunch of non abelian manuals. Kind of, yeah. Size. Or two different, or a pattern of alternating gap boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that produce for you? Uh, well, the, the ground state counting of these is more like some sort of Fibonacci number. No, 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 because they're actually parafermions where people talk about it in terms of parafermion or parafermion chain. So in the case K equals K equals one, this becomes the Majorana chain. Yes. So it scales like two to the N. When you take K equals three, it scales like, I guess, six to the N. Um, it's this generalized, people sometimes call it parafermion structure, generalized Majorana chain. You get basically, yeah, it's described by. Not in many of these cases, no. Not for the billion cases, you just get these um, degeneracies that scale with an integer power. They're, yeah, they're kind of very tame examples. They're not useful for universal quantum computation. Um, yeah. I have a slightly crazy question. Your algebra of views is very similar to the algebra of line operators and the infinite transimers theory yeah. that she was talking about. Yeah, 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 we thought about that. Yeah, so the mathematics is similar. We don't know how to make a physical connection, but the mathematics is similar because this gamma is basically the inverse. It's related to the inverse of some integer matrix. Um, and so um, an integer matrix that's, uh, you know, local, it just has non-zero terms near the diagonal, basically. So whenever you invert a matrix like that, you get this kind of structure, at least if, if you get it, if it has a gap spectrum, that integer matrix. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's an inverse of, inverse of integer, almost diagonal matrices. And so, yeah, it's the same mathematics, but I don't know how to, yeah, the physics. But then you get integer matrix have a finite range. Yeah, the, the one you invert has a finite range. You start with a matrix with a finite range, but then when you invert it, you get, you get exponential terms, yeah. Well, I think it's time to thank him again for a wonderful talk.